السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين um, Welcome to day one from uh, our series inshallah ta'ala the, the title of the series is Living with Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam in Ramadan and uh, inshallah ta'ala for the whole month of Ramadan we will be covering um, the surah or the chapter of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam so one of the things that you guys need to have absolutely with you while we cover this series is you need to have your English translation of the Quran with you all right your English translation of the Quran um, and for the whole month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, for the days that were stipulated on the flyer, which was um, the, the days were Friday and Saturday and Monday and Wednesday. That is Friday and Saturday, Monday and Wednesday. These are the days that we will have class. They will not be every single day. All right. Um, but for these days, inshallah, we will concentrate only on the story of Prophet Yusuf, alayhi salam. Only on the story of Prophet Yusuf. Uh, and this will be throughout the whole Ramadan. And we will uncover, inshallah ta'ala, all of, dig out all of the treasures and the trinkets and the jewels that are buried in this story. There are so many jewels that are buried in this story, man. Subhanallah. And we want to try to uncover and, and, and grab as much of those jewels as we possibly can. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to. All right, so I'll begin this series with the dua that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make. Allahumma ij'al al-Qur'an rabi'a qulubina wa nura sudurina wa jala'a humumina wa dhahaba ahzanina wa rzuqna tilawatahu adhana layli ana'a layli wa atraf al-nahar ala wajih al-ladhi yurdika anna. O oh Allah, make the Qur'an rabi'a qulubina Make the Qur'an like the spring of our heart. Make it, Rabi'a is, is spring in Arabic, the springtime. And we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the Qur'an Rabi'a Kulubina, the spring of our heart. It's where our hearts, you know, begin to flourish. We begin, our hearts begin to grow, all right? Nurture, allow the Qur'an to nurture our hearts, to be the Rabi'a Kulubina, to be the spring of our hearts. sudurina, And allow it to be the light of our chest. The light of our hearts. humumina, And allow the Quran to remove any anxiety. Any stress. Any anxiety that we experience. ahzanina, And allow the Quran to remove any of the, uh, the, the, the huzn. Any of the stress and the grief that we are experiencing. And allow us, bless us with the ability to recite your book at night and at the two ends of the day. Allow us to recite the Quran at night and at the ends of the day in a manner that is pleasing to you, O Allah. In a manner that is pleasing to you. Understand something that Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. This is the month of the Qur'an. And if we don't do anything else in this month other than cover a sword to Yusuf from the Qur'an, then we have done our job of honoring this month. This is the month in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Qur'an. As Allah says in the Qur'an, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ هُدَى لِلنَّاسِ the month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. Huda linnas, a guidance for mankind. min al huda, and a clarification of the guidance. Wal furqan, and a distinction between truth and falsehood. It is our navigation. This is the month of the Quran. And so therefore we should spend our, you know, we should spend our days and our nights studying this book, reviewing this book. And if we don't, and I don't want to be all over the place with the Quran. I want to focus right here 
on one particular chapter in the Quran. In this chapter, I promise you, this particular chapter, Surah Al Yusuf, and I have been wanting to do this for a long time. I just, you know, I just couldn't get the energy. There were other things that I wanted to cover, but this was the time. The time was right. The time was right. Subhanallah. The time is just, it's right. We're at home and, you know, we're here. You know, usually I would be in the masjid. And, you know, sometimes you go to the masjid right before iftar to do a class. And there's, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten people there. People are not really there. Some people are online. Some people are not really there. We're grounded now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has managed to ground us. We're here, stuck in our homes. And many of us have no other choice but to open up our phones and listen at this point, man. Now, I got your attention. Now, religious scholars have your attention. Now, religious preachers and teachers have your attention. Because you don't have anything else to do. If you're at home and you're watching TV right now, shame on you. Shame on you. If you are at home watching TV right now, sitting in front of a television watching TV right now, and there's an hour left before the fast, this is the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving Muslims. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that there is a time when the fasting Muslim, if he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything, Allah will give him what he asked him for. And that is at the time right before he breaks his fast. If we don't have your attention now, we will never have your attention. So living with Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed many stories in the Qur'an. Uh, these stories are not just mere tales of old, are not just history stories, but stories that have you know, a plethora of lessons embedded in them. And you have to unearth, you have to go into these surahs, and you have to begin combing through these surahs and pulling out the wisdom, the jewels, it's like we are miners and we are going into this Sora, you know, with our hard hats on and our shovels. And we are trying to dig through these Soras and pull out all of the jewels that are hidden and buried in these Soras. As much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us to. As this is his book and he is the one who grants wisdom. He is the one who grants understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Yu'til hikmata man yasha. That he gives hikmah, gives wisdom to whomsoever he pleases. And whomsoever has been given wisdom, that he has been given an abundance of good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَفَهَمْنَاهَا Sulaiman," And we gave Sulaiman faham. We gave Sulaiman understanding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَى and he gave Adam the knowledge of all of it. So knowledge, understanding, wisdom, all comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are all the tools that we need to extract, to go into the surah and to extract everything that is in there of wisdom, of life lessons that we can take along with us along our journey. And that's what we intend to do, bi-idhnillah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Mu'allimu Adam, the one who taught Adam. Mufahim Sulaiman, the one who gave Sulaiman fahim. The one who gives hikmah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us what we need from this surah. We beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to open up this chapter, allow us to open up this surah, and to allow us to open up our hearts as we go through this surah and begin to absorb all of the wisdom, all of the knowledge that is in this surah, bi idnillahi ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed many surahs and many stories in the Quran. And these stories are not just, you know, history. This is not just history, although it is. But these stories have a myriad and a plethora of lessons that are embedded in them for the purpose of reflection and direction. Reflection and direction. For us to reflect and ponder on these stories and to gain from these stories direction, divine direction, so that we know where we're going in our lives. We know how to navigate the terrain. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 11, ayah 120, وَكُلَّنَّ قُصُّ عَلَيْكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءَ الرُّسُلِ 
ما يثبت به فؤادك وجاءك في هذه الحق وموعظة وموعظة وذكرى للمؤمنين الله سبحانه وتعالى says in this ayah in surah Hud surah number 11 ayah 120 وكلا نقص عليك من أنباء الرسل and all of these stories we have given to you the lives stories from the rusul the messengers in all of them we have given you stories of the messengers ma yuthabbitu bihi fu'adak that which will make your heart firm in these lessons in these stories are lessons that will make your heart firm that will give you thabat al qalbiya will give you firmness of your heart wa mu'idha and an admonition for you and a reminder to the believers. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking to the Prophet sallallahu about why he revealed to him the stories of the prophets and messengers. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicating to the Prophet sallallahu why he revealed to him stories of the prophets and messengers. Because in them is uh, what will make his heart firm. You got you to gotta keep in mind, as I'll get into, that when were these stories revealed to the Prophet ﷺ? In the Meccan period or in the Medinan period? In the Meccan period. So the Prophet ﷺ was experiencing trial and tribulation in the Meccan period. He was on a run. There was a bounty on his head. Muslims were being tortured. Muslims had to flee and go to Abyssinia twice. So there was a lot of trepidation, there was a lot of fear in the hearts of many Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals as a mercy to the Prophet وسلم, the stories of the prophets and messengers. Ma yuthabbitu bihi fu'adik, what will give your heart firmness. Waja'aka fi hadihi al-haq, and will bring to you the truth. That the message that you are preaching is the truth. Look at all of the prophets and messengers who have come before you and look at how look at what they went through, look at what they experienced. And, and it is an admonition and a reminder to those who believe. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah number in Surah number 12, in, in the chapter of Yusuf himself, Surah number 12, ayah 111, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lakat kana fi qasasihim ibratun li ulil albab. ما كان حديثا يفترى ولكن تصديق الذي بين يدي وتفصيلا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون. Allah subhanahu wa taala says لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأول الألباب that in these stories, the stories of the prophets and messengers in the Quran, لقد كان في قصصهم in these stories عبرة are lessons. لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَاب For men and women of understanding. In them are lessons for men and women of understanding. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثَ يُفْتَرَى These are not made up tales. These are not made up narratives for the purpose of entertainment. These are not made up narratives for the purpose of entertainment. People say, oh, I love that surah. Oh, I love that story. This is not for the purpose of entertainment. He said, in these stories are lessons الألباب, for men and women of deep reflection and understanding. These are not made up stories and narratives for the purpose of entertainment. But it is a clarification of the, the, the stories that came before Clarification of everything. It is a confirmation of the Quran that is with you. That the stories that are in the Quran of the prophets and messengers is a confirmation because these same stories are mentioned in the previous books. So to find them mentioned in the Quran, obviously which with much more detail in the Quran, it is a confirmation that the Quran is true. These narratives could not have come from anyone other than God. Where did they come from? The same stories. The same, the same stories that are in the Quran, are in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in uh, the Torah, in the previous books. And then to find them also, these same men, the same men, some of the same stories, obviously the Quran is giving us a little bit more detail. Tasdeek al-ladhi bayni yaday. وَتَفْصِيلًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ 
It is a confirmation of the book that you have and a detailed explanation of everything. Pay attention. What did Allah say about the story? Tafsil al kulli shayt. That it is a tafsil. It is an explanation of everything. That means that in these stories are lessons and information that help us to navigate our lives. Wahudan and guidance, wa rahma and mercy for those who believe. And since Ramadan is the month of the Quran, I thought it would be a benefit for us all to explore some of the lessons that are embedded, some of the jewels that are embedded in the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, one of the most beautiful stories in the Quran. This is the most beautiful story in the Quran and we'll get to that in the next lesson. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called this surah, called this story, the story of Prophet Yusuf, Ahsan al-Qasas. The best of all stories in the Quran. The most beautiful story in the Quran. Why would you not want to read this story? Why would you not want to flip page after page after page? Wallahi, last night I was up to about 1.30. I couldn't even go to sleep going through the tafsir. And, and I mean, it wasn't something that I, I hadn't done before. But just reviewing, revisiting it. I couldn't put it down. Allah refers to this surah as the most beautiful story in the Quran. Ahsan al-Qasas. That we reveal to you the most beautiful story. The Quran, brothers and sisters, is replete with life lessons, personal ob objectives and instructions, guidance and guidelines for all of mankind. For all of mankind. The stories of the prophets and messengers were amongst the themes that were found in the suwar, which is the plural of surah. Surah is the singular, surah to nas, surah to nasr, surah to nahal. This is surah, that's the singular. The plural of surah is suwar, S-U-W-A-R, suwar is the plural of surah. So you don't have to say these surahs. You now know the plural of it is suwar. But these suwar that are in the Quran, some of them were revealed in the Meccan period, some of them were revealed in the Medinan period. If you have an English translation of the Quran right now in your hand, turn to the chapter of Yusuf. At the beginning of the chapter, it will tell you whether it is Mekkiya or Medinia. Mekkiya or Medinia. What this means. It's not that these are the sores that were revealed in Mecca, sores that were revealed in Medina. No. al makkiya wa Madiniya sores. These are sores that were revealed either before Hijrah or after Hijrah. The sores that were revealed before Hijrah or after Hijrah. So if they were revealed before the Prophet ﷺ made the migration in that 13 year period in Mecca, any surah that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the 13-year period in Mecca are called a suwar al makkiya These are Meccan surahs. And any surah that was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the 10 years that he was in Medina, after he migrated, any time after he migrated for the next 10 years of his life, they were called a suwar al madiniya the Medinan surahs. And they are called that for a reason. They're called that. The scholars, they separate them like this for a reason. Why? Because the surahs that are Mekkiya, the surahs that were revealed before Hijrah, and the surahs that were revealed after Hijrah are theme-oriented. Theme-oriented, meaning these surahs have focus on a particular subject matter. The surah that were Mekkiya, the surahs that were revealed in the Meccan period before the migration, they focused on three things. Focus on the three things. Number one, they focus on uh, tawheed and shirk. Correcting the belief of the Meccans, the pagans and the pagan Arabs in Mecca, who their uh, preferred lifestyle was idolatry. So many of the ayahs that deal with Tawheed and who Allah is and who Allah is not and why Allah should be worshipped and why others should not be worshipped 
the metaphors, the, the directives, the commands, all of those subject matters, all of those eyes were revealed in the Meccan period. Also, um, and that was, of course, to supply the Prophet Sallallahu with the knowledge that he needed at the beginning of his mission. His mission was to eat. Make no mistake about that. That was his mission. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supplying him with ayats from the Quran to help him in that mission. Ammunition of some sort to defend himself against the onslaught, the verbal onslaught of Quraysh. Those who were defending not just their idolatry, but defending their lifestyle. Keep in mind, this was a lifestyle. Idolatry for them was a lifestyle. Their whole political system was based upon worshiping idols, the idolatry. So Tawheed comes along and upsets the entire social order. Tawheed comes along and upsets the entire social order. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supplying him with verses and surahs dealing with Tawheed and Shirk. As he continues to unravel and unloosen their entire social fabric. You understand? Their entire social fabric. Secondly, the verses, the surahs and verses that were revealed in the Meccan period, they focus on descriptions of paradise and hellfire. So all of the surahs that you'll find that deal with the deep descriptions of paradise and hellfire were revealed in the Meccan period before the Hijrah. Why? Because you got to now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supplied the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the ammunition he needed for his mission. But what about the believers? What about those who are following him? What incentive do they have? Yeah, they believe in him. They believe that what he's saying is the truth. But what incentive do they have from the heavens? A promise of paradise. Guess what paradise looks like? Gardens under which rivers flow. You will remain therein forever. These ayats and surahs that were revealed describing paradise and how beautiful it is. And those who fear their Lord, women khaf rabbihi. Whoever fears the status, the position of their Lord over them, then for him is two jannas, two paradises. Jannatan. Which of the favors of your Lord would you deny? Who's going to deny that? If I follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I fear Allah. I do right by God. I'm going to get two paradises, two gardens in paradise. So there's an incentive there. For those who were following him. He's a prophet. He spoke directly to Angel Jibreel. He didn't need any incentive. He's straight. He's good. What about his followers? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals sorrows and ayats describing paradise. As well as describing the hellfire. What the hellfire looks like. Those who are going to be tortured in the hellfire. Why they're going to be in the hellfire. All right, And that is also an incentive, not just for those who believed, but also for those who disbelieved. Start making them think twice. Start making them think twice. Because it's so descriptive, there is no other religious text other than the Quran that describes paradise and hell in such detail. No other religious text that describes paradise and hell with so much detail. And that was an incentive. That was an incentive. The other theme that the surahs and ayats that were revealed in the Meccan period focused on was the stories of prophets and messengers. The stories of the prophets and messengers. Why? Because... As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, In surah number 46, ayah 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Be patient. As those prophets and messengers of strong will before you were also patient. 
Be patient like they were. وَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلْ لَهُمْ And do not supersede them. Do not go ahead of them. Do not deviate from their path. So Allah revealed the stories of the prophets and messengers. All of the stories of the prophets and messengers were revealed in the Meccan period. Look at every single story of prophet, messenger, so, uh, Maryam, whether it's Ibrahim, Musa. Look at every single one of those surahs. Look at every single one of those stories, those ayats, and they are revealed in the Meccan period. Why? Because when people are faced with traumatic situations, they oftentimes think that they are the only ones having that experience. Have you ever gone through a hardship, a misfortune in your life, and you thought that you were the only one going through that? Look at our children, our teenagers. They must have thought that we were never teenagers before. Because when they go through their hardships, whether in high school, whether at work or wherever, they tend to think that they are an anomaly. They are the only ones that have ever gone through this. Like, we've never experienced that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, dad, but you don't understand. Yeah, umi, mommy, you, but you don't get it. You don't understand. You, don't, you grew up in a different time. It's the same struggle. <laughs> it's a different time, but the same struggle. It's the same struggle. But people, when they go through traumatic situations, they oftentimes think that they are the only ones having that experience and nobody else having that experience. They believe that their experience is an anomaly. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Allah revealed to him the stories of the prophets and messengers to show him, you are not an anomaly, you are not alone. Every prophet and messenger who came before you went through the same thing. If not worse, what does that do when you find out, oh, snap, I'm not the only one who goes through this? Other people who experience this? Like when we're having problems at home with our children, they break stuff, they destroy stuff, and you're like, oh my God, I wonder do other parents go through this? And then when you run into another parent, she's like, please, my child does this, or my kid broke this, or my kid destroyed this. You're like, oh, okay, I'm not crazy, right? I'm not crazy. Other parents do go through this. It's not an, I'm not an anomaly. And you, content, you, you relax. You don't exacerbate your feelings. Your sentiments are not exacerbated. Not exaggerated because you realize you are not the only one that goes through that. You understand? Similar to a situation that happened with the Prophet Sallallahu Hadith is collected in Sahih al-Bukhari. One day he passed by a woman who was standing over a grave and she's sobbing. She's standing over the grave of her son who died and she's sobbing. She's crying. She's crying profusely, sobbing profusely. And the Prophet ﷺ walks behind her and gently says to her, In another narration, he said, He whispered in her, behind her, real gently, and he said to her, Fear Allah and be patient. Fear Allah and be patient. In another narration, he said, Ispiri wahtasibi. Be patient and desire your reward from Allah. Allah rewards you during your times of trauma. Allah rewards you during your time of trial and tribulation. The reward is exaggerated. Be patient. And she says to the Prophet, not knowing that it was the Prophet, she says to him exactly what we usually say to people when they tell us, fear Allah, be patient. She said, Ilayka anni fa inna kalam tu sab ma asabani. She said, get away from me because you don't know what I'm going through. You haven't experienced what I am experiencing. You don't know my pain. You don't know what I'm going through, right? Tend to think that you are an anomaly. She's saying this to the Prophet ﷺ. She doesn't know that it's him. Focusing on is the sentiment. She thinks that she's an anomaly, she doesn't understand that the man she's talking to has lo also lost his own child. His son, Ibrahim, died in his arms at 18 months old. So when the Prophet ﷺ says to her, Is speedy, it taqillah, what's speedy? Fear Allah and be patient. 
He's not speaking from a place of privilege. He has had his own share of death. He lost his own son. His son Ibrahim died in his arms. He watched his son take his last breaths, gasping for air. Can you imagine? This is a prophet, a messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spared Ibrahim. He ordered him to slaughter his son. And then when he put the knife to his neck, Allah sent a, a, a lamb for him to slaughter instead. His son would have died in his arms, but Allah spared him. But the last prophet and messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Habibullah, Habibullah, the beloved of Allah, the beloved of God, the last and final messenger, the best of all prophets and messengers, Allah didn't even spare him. He lost his son in his own arms. He lost his own son in his arms, gasping for air, gasping for taking his last breaths in his arms, 18 months old. And so when she said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Get away from me Because you haven't been tested with what I've been tested with In fact, he had In fact, he had <laughs> You understand? And he was a prophet On top of all of that SubhanAllah So the next time you tell somebody, you don't know what I'm going through, you couldn't possibly understand what I'm going through. Maybe I don't know exactly what you are experiencing, but I've had my own share of pain myself. And I'm not speaking to you from a place of privilege. I'm not speaking to you from a place of privilege. I've had my own share of, you know, misfortunes and trials and calamities in my own life. I, I've seen my share of pain. So when I speak to you, I'm not speaking to you from a place of privilege. No, I don't know what you are experiencing. I don't know how deep your pain runs. I don't. But I have had my own share of pain as well. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended by revealing these surahs, these ayats, with the stories of the prophets and messengers, so that the Prophet ﷺ could get the experience, could experience, could show him that what you are experiencing of people chasing you, people trying to kill you, people, you know, labeling you a liar and a, and, and a soothsayer and a magician and crazy, right? That you don't feel that you are all alone in that. Every prophet and messenger who came before you experienced the same thing, if not worse. And when you know that, what, what happens when you know that? When you know that somebody else has had the same experience you are having or even worse, it allows you to endure and to tolerate, to tolerate and to persevere in your tolerance because you realize that this is the path that I'm on. This comes with the territory. This comes with the territory. Scholars, when you look at what Imam Ahmed went through, put in prison and lashed and beat, a doctor said that I carved off of the back of Imam Ahmed dead skin that I had never seen anybody beat like that ever in my life. I had never seen an individual beat like that before. Imam Ahmed was whipped, was lashed. Many times the skin came off of his back simply because he would not acquiesce to the deviant belief that the Quran has created. Ibn Taymiyyah ta died in prison, was put in prison. He wrote letters from prison that we have in books right now translated into English. Letter, Ibn Taymiyyah's letters from prison. You read that book, you see, you can feel the pain that this man is experiencing behind bars for none other than the truth. So when a scholar now becomes prominent and becomes popular amongst the masses in today's time and people begin tearing him down, tearing his honor down, calling him a deviant, calling him a stray, calling him this, calling him that. When you read those stories of, you know, the scholars who came before you, it allows you to embrace your experience. This comes with the territory and there's nothing that you can do or say that will deter me from my path. You understand? Nothing. This is what gives you steadfastness. I remember a student of knowledge, prominent student of knowledge said to me one time, he said, Brother Shadid, if the scholars had warned against me the way they warned against you, I probably would have left Islam. In those words. 
He said, if the scholars had warned against me like they warned against you, the way people attacked you, I probably would have left Islam. But when you understand that this is the path, this comes with the territory, you don't budge, you don't fold, you don't crack under pressure, you don't fold. You understand that pressure busts pipes, but struggle builds character. And I'm all for it. I'm here for it all. Because I understand that this comes with the, this comes with the territory. Look at the people who came before you. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was a, what we would consider a modern-day computer, memorize a million hadith off the top of the head, can run back a million hadith with each isnad. <laughs> Fulan narrated on Fulan, who narrated on Fulan, who narrated on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who said X, Y, Z, one hadith, two hadith, narrate a modern-day computer who wrote Sahih al-Bukhari from his memory, who wrote Tariq al-Kabir, the history book that he wrote. Ten volumes of Tariq al-Kabir that he wrote on a journey from his memory, starting with the life of the Prophet and then Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, Ali, Fulan, Fulan, Fulan. He wrote Tariq al-Kabir. 18 years old, from his memory. You understand? And even Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, was warned against about, by his own teacher. His own teacher. I, or no other student of knowledge that is alive and well in today's time, are in nowhere near in comparison. You could gather all of the students of knowledge and scholars and imams and preachers and teachers and we could put us all in one kiffa. You could put us all in one scale and put the knowledge of Imam al-Bukhari. You could just put Sahih al-Bukhari in one scale and all of the knowledge that exists on the earth today would not even be equivalent to Sahih al-Bukhari. And Sahih al-Bukhari is not the only book that he wrote. Sahil Bukhari, the 7,000 some odd hadith that are in Sahil Bukhari, it was actually more than that. He took out some of the hadith because he didn't want it to be a burden on the Muslim ummah. You understand? And even he was warned against by his own scholar. Muhammad ibn Yahya, al-Dhulli, his own sheikh warned against him out of jealousy, out of sheer jealousy and envy. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals these stories to the Prophet sallallahu um, to show him that he's not an anomaly, that you are not the only one having this experience. There are others who are having this experience just like you who came before you. And when you understand that, then you're able to settle in your place, in your path. Settle in your path. Right? Settle in your path and move along with ease without allowing it to deter you to the right or to the left. And just as what was intended by these stories, the Prophet ﷺ learned the lessons that were hidden in these stories. This story, the story of Prophet Yusuf that we are about to cover, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ read this story. The story of Prophet Musa, Prophet Moses, the Prophet ﷺ, he read that story. The story that we are about to read, the Prophet ﷺ read that story. And he learned the lessons that were in it. I'll end with this last story. The Prophet ﷺ, after the battle of Hunayn, which was the, the battle of Ta'if, where the Prophet ﷺ went to war with Ta'if, and this was after the conquest of Mecca, eight, eight years after Hijrah, the battle of Hunayn. After that battle, the Prophet ﷺ stopped at a particular place and he began to distribute some of the spoils of war to his companions, as he used to. And he's passing out you know, distributing the spoils of war. He gives one companion, Aqra ibn Habis, he gave him a hundred camels. If you remember, Aqra ibn Habis, this was the same companion who the Prophet Wasallam saw him, you know, the, he saw the Prophet Wasallam kiss his grandsons, Hassan and Hussein, and he said, you kiss the boys? And the Prophet Wasallam said, yes, I kissed the boys. And he said, well, Allah, you have ten sons, I've never kissed any one of my sons. And the Prophet Wasallam said to him, well, what do you want me to do if Allah has removed mercy? From your heart. That's Aqra ibn Habis. The Prophet ﷺ gave him a hundred camels. There was another individual who the Prophet ﷺ gave him a hundred camels. And there was another man who, watching the Prophet distribute the spoils of war, 
He says underneath his breath, he says, this distribution is unfair, nor is it being done for the sake of Allah. Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he heard him make this comment. And he said, Wallahi, I'm going to go tell the Prophet ﷺ what you said. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud who went to the Prophet ﷺ and told him, hey, this guy over here said that, you know, this distribution is unfair. You're giving this one 100 camels, you're giving this one less, you're giving this one this, and you're giving this one that. He said, this distribution is unfair, and you're not doing it for the pleasure of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu his face became red, angry. How could you make that comment about me eight years after Hijrah, 13 years in Mecca, 18 years in Medina, and you still don't trust me? And you don't trust me in a, man, in a matter of dunya? This is not deen. I'm not giving you ayat. I'm not giving you something religious. I'm, distri I'm distributing the spoils of war. Dunya, in a dunya affair, you would accuse me of being unfair in something so minuscule as distributing dunya? Eight years after hijrah and you still don't trust me? The Prophet Wasallam said, Way haq. He said, woe be to you. Who was be fair if Allah and his messenger is not going to be fair? If I'm not fair and I'm speaking on behalf of God, if I'm not fair, then who's going to be fair? Then the Prophet Sallallahu he came to the realization using the jewels from the stories that he read. He said, Yarahamallah. Musa, فقد أوذي بأكثر من هذا فصبرا. He said, "May Allah have mercy on Musa." <laughs> this situation angered him so much, he turned around and made du'a for Musa. <laughs> he said, "May Allah have mercy on Prophet Musa." He was harmed with worse than this, and he was patient. You, you, you follow me? He learned that he was not an anomaly. That what happened to him. Happened to the prophets that came before him by his own people, his own followers. Obviously, this guy was not a follower of the Prophet Nine times out of ten, a hypocrite, because the comment that he made would have been considered kufr, would have been considered disbelief. But listen to the Prophet Wasallam's statement. He said, may Allah have mercy on Musa. It angered, the situation angered him. You ever been angry so much so to the point where you turn and you say, you know, may Allah have mercy upon so-and-so who was here and dealt with way more than what I'm dealing with now. It angered you to such a point that it angered him to such a point that he turned around and he made dua for Musa. He said, may Allah have mercy upon Musa. He was harmed with worse than this and he was patient. Meaning the harm that this guy just did to me Musa was harmed with worse than this, and he was patient, so I'll just be patient. He learned the lesson from the stories of the prophets and messengers, and that was to show him that the pain that you are experiencing along your journey, you are not an anomaly. You are not an anomaly. You are not the only one having this experience. All right? So we are going to, you know, uh, explore... All right, the story of Prophet Musa, uh, the story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam during this month of Ramadan. And we are going to extract all of the trinkets, all of the treasures that are buried in this surah. We're going to go in and we are going to comb this surah for as much information and lessons that we possibly can, inshallah. As much as Allah will allow us. As much as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow us. So tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala, we will start with the beginning of Surah to Yusuf Alif Lam Ra. All right. And then we'll be covering. We're not going to stop on every single ayat, but we are going to stop on the ayats that have that are, you know, you can see that there's some wisdom in there. There's some there's some stuff embedded in there that we need. We need to get it out. Right. Sort of to you look at sort of to Yusuf as you know as a as a mine, and we're going in with our tools, and we are going in to come out with some jewels. We're not coming in here with nothing. We're not coming out of this empty-handed. We're going in there with the intention of extraction, extraction, 
and we are extracting all of the jewels and wisdom. So we're going to stop on ayats that are loaded. There's some ayats that have some wisdom in it, and then there's some ayats that are loaded. Those are the ones that we're going to spend most of our time on. Those verses that are loaded with wisdom and lessons, jewels that we can get, that we can take along with us along our journey. Jazakumallahu khairan. Spend the remaining minutes that are left before uh, iftar, inshallah ta'ala, making dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the dua of the fasting person. And please keep myself and my family in your dua, and I will do the same for you all. جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. You guys have been great. May Allah subhanahu wa taala accept your fast. Uh, today was the first day of fasting. Alhamdulillah, you guys did great. The day went by like this. It went by very quickly, very quickly, very quickly. And inshallah ta'ala, the days will get easier and easier as you train yourself, as you condition yourself to do this over and over again. For those of you who are new Muslims, and this is your first year fasting, ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban bikum, may Allah, you know, welcome you into the fold of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy upon you to fast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from you what you are offering at such an early phase or stage since your conversion to Islam. But be patient, trust me. This is, this is very easy and you can do this. For those of you who tell yourself, I don't know if I can do this. Today was very hard. Today was not hard. Today was not hard. Trust me. Today was easy. And it only gets easier and easier after each and every day. Allah says at the end of the ayats dealing with fasting. Allah only wishes for you ease. And he does not wish for you difficulty. If fasting was too difficult, Allah would not have obligated on you. Or you would have fallen into one of the categories where you are exempt. Where you are exempt. Today was easy. Wallahi, today was easy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. And accept from you your fasting, your dua, your standing. Bi'ithnillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.